that I might not be delivered over to the Jews, but my kingdom is not of this world. And then Pilate said to him, so you are a king. And Jesus answered, you say that I am a king. For this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I have come into the world to bear witness to the truth. And everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. And Pilate said to him, what is truth? And after he had said this, Pilate went back outside to the Jews and told them, I find no guilt in him. That's verse 38. Look over at verse 4 of chapter 19. Pilate went out again and said to them, See, I am bringing him out to you that you may know I find no fault in him. So Jesus came out wearing a crown of thorns and a purple robe. And Pilate said to them, Behold this man. And when the chief priests and the officers saw him, they, they cried out, Crucify him! Crucify him! And Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him. I find no guilt in him. And so Jesus meets again with Pilate. And in verse 12, after the meeting, from then on, Pilate sought to release him, but the Jews cried out, if you release this man, you are no, you are no friend of Caesar. In verse 16, so he delivered them, delivered him over to them to be crucified. Over and over again, the one who would condemn him to death is the one who kept saying, not once, not twice, but three times, I find no guilt in him. I used to think that that was so odd that they could live in a time in which the crowd would have such an influence upon one man or upon one group of people. But now we seem to be living in that time, do we not? When the crowd seems to have such influence upon what leaders and our officials are doing. He was not guilty. Supreme Court Justice, the late Antonin Scalia, one time was discussing the death penalty with a friend of his. And the friend says, I don't believe that the death penalty should be done on anyone because you might end up executing an innocent person. Antonin Scalia said, can you name me one? He said, I have looked and I have studied and I have researched and I have not found one innocent person who was ever executed in this country by lethal ways. Not one, he says. And while that may be true here in America since the beginning of our country, it is certainly not true at Calvary that Friday. Because at Calvary that Friday, there were three men sentenced to die, and the one in the middle was completely innocent. And Pilate knew it. His disciples knew it. And his mom most certainly knew it. Jesus, not, Jesus died not because he was guilty, but because we were guilty. You were guilty, and I was guilty. That's why he died. Point number two. Her silence speaks volumes. In this account that we read from verse 17 down to verse 30, there is not one word that is attributed to Mary at the, at the cross. There are four times in Scripture in which Mary is a major player, a major role carrier in 
the narrative of Jesus. The first is at his birth. She has a lot to do at the birth. And she speaks a lot at the birth. The second is the time in which she lost Jesus for three days, and she shared a little bit with him about that when she found him. Okay? The third one was at the wedding of Cana, where she lets her son know that they've ran out of wine. And the fourth one is here at the cross. She speaks at her birth, at, it, at the birth of Jesus. She speaks at the losing of Jesus at the temple. And she speaks at the time in which the wedding is there, but she does not have one recorded word in scripture about being at the cross. Not one word. Isn't that amazing? In fact, if you look at the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, you will not find that Mary, the mother of Jesus, is even listed as being an important part of the crucifixion scene. It's not that she wasn't there. She was certainly there because Jesus speaks to her from the cross. It is just not that important in the scheme of things that Mary is there. Now, I do not want to speak on what is not written in Scripture. And I don't want to add to what is not recorded in Scripture. I don't want to say this is what I think she might have been thinking. What I want to do is to say this is what I know that she knew while she was there. And I've come up with five of what I know that Mary knew while she was there watching her son being crucified and watching him die. Five things that are there that are for you and for me. And the first one is this. She knew that her son was a virgin born son. She knew that the father of Jesus was not in an ordinary way. That the father of Jesus was there, a father God, so that he would be born the son of God. Born the son of the most high God. She knew that Jesus was not an ordinary man on the cross. Point number two. She knew that she had been prophesied about that in scripture. She knew that in scripture... It had told that she was going to come and to be a part of this salvation experience. And so I have a couple of scriptures for you. And the first one is this. Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. If you'd pass one more, guys. At the time of giving of the Lord... And the Lord bringing judgment upon both Adam and Eve and a serpent. The Lord says to the serpent, and I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. And he will bruise your head and you will bruise his heel. Notice that it does not say between your seed and his seed. It is between your seed and her seed. The only one who was born of her seed was Jesus. Because in every other birth, it took a man to be a part of it. And the man was the one who provided the seed, but not in Jesus. You know, the seed was provided and given by her. Next scripture, if you would, Ian. She knew this from the Isaiah, the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. She knew that she was the one who was prophesied about in Scripture, that she was going to be the virgin who was with child, and that child would be called God with us. The third thing is, that 
She knew she didn't pick out Jesus' name. An angel brought that message from God himself, from the Father. She remembered that Gabriel's words to her and to Joseph were this. One more, Ian. And she will give birth to a son, and you will give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. She knew that her son, who was on the cross, had came to save people from their sins. And I think the reason also she knew and probably remembered at this moment was a time when she was coming into the temple, bringing Jesus for the time of purification, the time of dedication. And she and Joseph came into the temple courts and there was a man by the name of Simeon. And Simeon took Jesus into his arms for he had been promised by the Holy Spirit. Although you're an old man, Simeon, you are not going to die until you see the Lord's salvation. And he takes Jesus in his arms and he says, Lord, you can now allow your servant to depart for I have seen your salvation. But he also spoke to Mary in that time. And here's what he said. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, this child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be spoken against so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed and a sword will pierce your own soul too. I wonder if that came to her mind and a sword will pierce your own soul too. For there was a lot of piercing going on that day, right hand, left hand, both feet, side that was impaled at the end. And I can imagine with each and every one of those, that would have been something that would have come to her. And if it didn't, at least it was being fulfilled. Her heart was being pierced at that moment. And the last one, I think, that probably she knew is that this one who is on the cross could do the miraculous. She knew he could change water into wine. She knew that he could heal, and she had seen him raise the dead. And what came to her mind in that, I don't know, but I knew, I do know that she knew that this Jesus could do the miraculous. Mary, the mother of Jesus, knew her son was innocent. She, in her silence, spoke volumes. And the third point is this. Her future is prepared. Woman, behold your son. And to the disciple, behold your mother. What is remarkable is that while Jesus is on the cross saving the world, he has not forgot about his mom. He was honoring his mom until the very end. Scripture says to honor your father and your mother. And we believe that Joseph had somehow undescribed, we don't know why, is not a part of the picture. We believe that he has passed away. He is not a part of much of Jesus' ministry. We don't see him past the time of his 12th time when he's in the temple. But we see his mother. We see his mother at Canaan. We see his mother come to see him when he's preaching. And we see her here. And he says to his mom, behold, your son. In that time, the oldest son was responsible for the father and the mother when they got old. Even though they had children that would come up later, the responsibility laid upon the oldest son. 
And now that Jesus was going, Jesus, instead of passing that responsibility on to the next sibling of sons that was after him, was to then say, no, I want you, Mom, to go with John. And John, I want you to take care of my mom. And from that moment on, John would take care of his mom. We're never told about how the rest of her life goes. The last time we will see Mary, the mother of Jesus, is not at the resurrection. The last time we see her is in Acts chapter 1 when she is in the upper room with all the group that's gathered there. And do you know what? We never see her after Acts chapter 1. Much to contrary belief, she is not a leader in the church today. Mary was not spoken of at all after Acts chapter 1. She was not given a role of leadership in the church. She was not a, a uh, player in saying, hey, this is the way that the church is going to go. This is not something that even the scripture talks about anymore about her because it was no longer about her. She had done her duty. And the Lord said, I'm going to take care of you even in my own death. Last point is this. Her salvation rests upon his death on the cross. Contrary to Catholic Church teaching, Mary was not sinless. She was not sinless at the time, and she is not a perpetual sinless person to today. She is not to be prayed to. She is not to be exalted and part of salvation. That is not a teaching of Scripture. And in fact, it's just the opposite. The opposite tells us these things. Next slide, Ian, please. That there is none righteous, no, not one. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Notice the, the exclusivity of that passage. There is none righteous, no, not one. And then it says, for all have sinned. Mary's included in that all. All have sinned and fallen short of God's glory. There was a time when Jesus was talking to one of the leaders of the community, I believe a lawyer, and the lawyer came to him and said, good teacher. And Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? There is no one who is good except God alone. There's no one who does good, Jesus said, including Mary. Mary was not sinless. She needed a savior just as much as you and I needed a savior. And in fact, in the, what is called the Magnificat, Magnificat, is a beautiful song that Mary had in Luke chapter 1 when she finds out that she is holding and, and the mother of this savior of the world. Next slide, if you would. She writes this in part, my soul glorifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior for he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant notice that she rejoices in God her Savior and that she knows her role her role is that God, the Savior of the world, the Father of all things, the one who designed this plan, has been merciful to her, a servant, and has given this great, wonderful opportunity for her to be the mother of the Son of God. We, like Mary, have committed sins, and all our sins are worthy of death. But Christ took our place. He was publicly executed and his blood was shed on our behalf. And once you and I see that what happened on that day outside of Jerusalem, you begin to see the cross through 
God's eyes. We begin to see it differently. It was not just a horrific event. That in this Jesus who is on the cross, he is saving you. And that the Father is saving you by the sacrifice of his Son. And the Father's wrath for your sin and for my sin was satisfied and was atoned for. And that God's wrath was satisfied by Jesus' death on a cross. And that there at the cross, God the Father, for six hours that Friday, was redeeming those sins that would be forgiven forever. Mary was there. But you know what? In a very real and honest way, so were you. You and I were there at the cross. At Easter time, we sing this song, Were You There? And the words say, Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Oh, sometimes it causes me to tremble. Were you there when they crucified my Lord? The answer to that is yes. The answer to that is yes. That we were there in a very real way because the sins of you and the sins of me were being paid for by Jesus on the cross. There's an interesting verse here in chapter 19, and I close with this. Look, if you would, over to verse um, chapter 19. Verse 35, someone writes in a third person, and it says this, He who saw it has borne witness. His testimony is true, and he knows that he is telling the truth, that you also may believe. We believe that that is John. John is saying, I saw it. I was there. And my testimony is true. And I am writing this down for you so that you will believe. And in fact, in chapter 20, he also says the same thing in verse 31 of chapter 20. These things are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. You see, the wonderful thing about the cross is, is that Christ has given us a picture, given us a description, given us a Savior, that if we look long enough, we will see ourselves in a great need for what he is doing. I saw this week a picture, a little video on Facebook. And it was from, a, I believe, a first or a second grade teacher. And the first and second grade teacher said, I told my, my students that a picture of my favorite student was in the box. And one by one, she asked them to go over and to look inside the box to see who their favorite, who her favorite student was. And so they walked over and they looked. And then they walked away. And then the next one came and they looked and they saw, and they smiled, and they walked away. And everyone who came and looked into the box saw into a picture their own face. Can I tell you this? When you look into the cross of Christ and you see a mirror that is on it, 
it will show you your face. That was your cross. That was my cross. That was your sin, not his. That was your guilt, not his. And when we look at the cross, and I challenge you, okay? Easter's coming. Good Friday's coming. If you want to have an impactful time with the Lord this year, get into the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and read the crucifixion scene. Read the story of the centurion who crucifies Jesus and by the end of the sixth hour makes the great declaration, this truly was the Son of God. Look at the cross long enough and you'll see yourself in it and your great need for it. What was once the worst day for Christians, it is the best day because it's the day in which we see how much God loved us. Some would say, well, that doesn't sound really good that God the Father would crucify his own son for people here all over the earth. Until you look and see that the plan of salvation was created before any of you and any of me and any of this world was ever made. Somewhere in eternity, prior to all the creation, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit got together and had this plan of salvation. So when it came to the point where Jesus would leave heaven out of that wonderful trinity and come to earth, would set aside his royalty and his His praise of all who is in heaven and come down to be ridiculed and to be looked at as someone who is a servant below servants, you see that Jesus is just fulfilling the plan. And even when he prayed that night in the garden, Father, if there's any other way, may this cup pass from me, but not my will. Your will, O Lord. Because your will, O Father, was our will way before I came down here. And Jesus would say, no one takes my life from me. I have the power to lay my life down and I have the power to raise it up again. And that is what he did. All praise, honor, and glory go to him this morning. Amen. Let's pray. Father, in the hearing of the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ, we see the bad news before we see the good news. And the bad news is that we all are sinners and we're all separated from a holy God. And if we stay in that condition of separation from you, we will never be in your presence. And when our time on earth is over, we will split hell wide open. But in between that time, there is a Savior who has died on the cross and he is extending his grace to us today to say, come to me and I will give you life and life eternal. And so today, Lord, there's a decision by some in this place They're in a place where they don't know you. And Lord, today could be the wonderful day that they step out of the darkness and step into the light and receive from you your grace and your salvation. Father, that's my prayer today, that someone would come to know you before this this service is over. If they would leave from where they're at when we sing this song and step out and come and greet me and say, I want to be saved today. For I have received Christ by faith today. And we will rejoice and celebrate with you. And know that God has called us to turn from ourselves and to turn to the cross and to follow him. Father, for us who have received you, it reminds us how glorious a salvation we have. And how how privileged we are to live in this world, knowing that we are in it, but we're not of it. 
and that our home is at home with you and that one day soon you're coming after us and you will receive us to yourself and we will meet you in the air and we will be with you forever. And for that, we rejoice today. Thank you, Lord, that you are indeed the Savior of all men. If there is one mediator between you, your Father, and mankind, and you are that one mediator that brings us to him. And so I pray, Lord, your will be done in these next few moments. In Christ's name I pray, amen. Will you stand? going to continue to pray. I'm going to ask you if you bow your heads. Because there is not a better time 